And joining us now from Green Bay is one of the guys covering that contest, Tom Rinaldi. And Tom, when football fans think about Tom Landry, they usually think of a great coach pacing the sidelines in his trademark fedora. But like so many of his generation, there's a lot more to Landry's legacy. Well, Kurt, let me begin by saying so great to see you and the guys and all the energy and this salute to the troops half the world away here at the Mecca of the National Football League Lambeau Field. You're right. We're excited about this matchup when it comes to the Cowboys. So many people focus on the iconic head coach Tom Landry, but long before he headed the Dallas Cowboys, he was part of a much larger team flying bombing missions for the Allied forces in World War II before becoming one of the game's greatest coaches. Coaches, he earned his place in the greatest generation. What do we owe them? It starts with knowing their stories. This is just one of one who served before the nation knew his name, back when the world was at war. Whether it was uh, flying the bomber or winning the Super Bowl, he would be at the top of the list as far as picking your heroes. The set jaw, the suit jacket, the signature fedora. As the head coach of the Dallas Cowboys for 29 seasons, Tom Landry was a portrait of exacting leadership. One thing about my father is that what you saw is really what you got. The public persona of him was, was quite true. He was the man you thought he was. I enjoy smiling, but I don't enjoy it on the sideline. I'm all business. Everybody knew where Tom Landry was on the sidelines. He was so precise about everything he did. If you were one minute late for a meeting or practice, you were fined. That was all part of his years in the military. Those years would shape the course of history. Landry left college after one semester, joining the U.S. Army Air Forces in 1943. The decision was patriotic, but personal. His brother Robert was killed over the North Atlantic just months before. He was sort of an idol to my dad as an older brother. It just completely, very, very much affected him, and he enlisted right then as an 18-year-old at the time, and he wanted to go in the Army Air Corps, which his brother was in. It was personal. By 1944, Second Lieutenant Thomas Landry was part of the 493rd Bomb Group, of the 8th Air Force. He was a co-pilot flying missions over Europe in a B-17. Ray Hobbs, now 98 years old, was also part of the Mighty 8th during World War II. I was flying the B-17 Flying Fortress. I was a commander, I was the first pilot. 18-year-old kids, that's all we were. We didn't have any idea how bad it really was. During the war, Landry took the right seat of his B-17 as co-pilot, flying out of England across the channel on bombing missions in Europe in 1944 and 45. The survival rate for B-17 pilots and their crew was less than 50%. When we got there, it was just a cloud of black smoke from flak as you headed into the target. It was like flying inside of a thundercloud. You just make the run, drop your bombs, and get out of the target area as quickly as you could. That image of flying with flak exploding all around you. One o'clock high, they're coming around, watch. Dad flew 30 missions. That's 30 chances to go up and not come back. One of our planes of my squadron was shot on the coast of Holland. There was 13 aboard. One survived.
the real heroes are all laying in those graves. It's, it's hard to describe. If you were called for a, a mission, that was to be what is to be, and uh, do your best with what you got to do. That line between life and death is the most paramount thing that a person can experience. Dad going through that, I think, helped him and focused him and just, you know, helped make him the person that he was and the coach that he was. Beyond his two Super Bowl wins, if there was one moment as a coach that personified Landry's dedication to mission, it came in 1986 in Anaheim when he coached the fourth quarter wearing a bulletproof vest. The call, as you were told, came from somebody's brother reporting the fact that his brother was in the stadium with a rifle. Yeah, that's what, uh, that's what I understand. His target was me. They felt that I should leave it at the end of the third quarter and go in and make a decision whether to stay in or put on a vest and come back out. So I decided to put a vest on and come back out again. As dangerous as it was, that that was not going to affect him. I don't think Coach had fear. <laughs> Not Coach Landry. One of the game's greatest coaches who served as part of a country's greatest generation. With honor for all. If our country was threatened the way it was at that time, whether you came back or not wasn't the important thing. So I could see myself doing it all again. Now that sounds like Coach Landry. I think he's a total hero. I mean, every, every aspect of his life. The fact that he was lucky enough to survive and to come home and to do the things that he did later on in his life, I'm very grateful for that. According to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, of the 16 million Americans who served in World War II, just over 170,000 are still alive and with us. That's just over 1%. So many of them, like Tom Landry, rarely spoke about their experiences in the war. But we are so grateful to know their stories, Landry's, and men like Ray Hobbs, those heroes, Kurt, who we celebrate, not just on Veterans Day, but every day. And the men and the women behind you share their legacy. And we're grateful for that. Thank you so much, Tom. You know, as he alluded to some of the numbers, as we get down to so few of our World War II veterans still being around, I think it's amazing to hear stories like that. And it's a good reminder for all of these men and women. Some of them sacrifice more than others, but all they give in honor of America.